to the degree that you want something is the degree you're afraid of not having. Yeah. God, I wish I started when I was younger. I go, well, yeah, but you didn't. So shut the fuck up and let's <laughs> right. keep going. Right. Like, you can't, <laughs> Nobody changes until they change their energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. Because it's not till then that it's really real. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is way worse than I thought. It's like, oh yeah, it's way, way worse than you thought. Yeah. But luckily there's more to you than you think. Sean Stevenson, my brother, welcome back on the show. It's my pleasure. Grateful to be here. Yeah, man. So you wrote an epic book on nutrition and the ways that nutrition interact with psychology, your relationships, your sleep patterns. And that's one of the beautiful things about this book is it's not singularly faceted. Like, all right, just eat this to lose weight. And of course, you include that because that's important. And a lot of us are trying to be metabolically healthy and trying to be aesthetically fit and all of these different things. And you cover that really well. But you also cover the full gamut of everything that's wrapped up and tangled, you know, caught in food, given your own stories about that time that, you know, you got that government cheese on a pizza and it was special to you. And it was, you know, all of these things that are really rich that, that identify like it's not just a simple thing about why we're choosing food. There's, there's a big, big thing to unpack in the why because a lot of us know what we should eat, but we don't. Why? And that's what's really cool is this book starts to get into that. Exactly. You know, we tend to put food into this very pithy little box, especially in the nutrition and diet world. Most folks often unconsciously directly contribute. When they hear the word diet, they think about weight. When they hear the word nutrition, they think about weight. And it hasn't served us very well because we've put in, we've taken food and put it in this little pithy box. But food is one of the most powerful entities in our universe because it truly does become us. You know, as I'm seeing you, you're seeing me right now, as folks are listening or watching, you know, the organs that they're seeing and listening through, it's made from the food that we eat. <laughs> it affects everything, you know, every cell of our brain, every cell of our liver, our pancreas, our heart is made from the food that we eat. It is remarkably powerful. And once we can start to uplevel our connection to food, and I thought that that was really the missing piece. And, you know, being in this space for almost 20 years now, and just seeing like the site, it really, really boils down to our belief in our association because having that understanding that food affects our weight is like a, it's like a belief that has very shoddy stability. But once I can bring this other leg under there that, hey, we've got data now that food like nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics, every bite of food you eat affects your genetic expression. We can start to print out better copies of you as another leg. Hey, we've got clinically proven data now that this particular food or this group of nutrients can directly improve your explicit memory and your declarative memory like that adds another leg. We've got data now showing that your diet, what you eat affects your, your ability to have compassion and patience and your ability to perspective take, and even your proclivity towards violence. We've got data on that. Boom, adds another leg. And so what I wanted to do was to create a very comprehensive understanding of what food is and how it affects our lives to give our association connection with the power of food more legs and just really make it more stable. And I think that this time, it's, it's, I can't believe it's coming out right now at this exact moment because I truly feel it's a message that can transform our society when we, when we need it so, so desperately. Yeah, and let's <clears throat> let's go right there first because you know so many of you heard you on my last podcast that we did together talking about mass and talking about this time that we're in and it's inexorably linked to metabolic health. Everything that we're experiencing with COVID and all of the fear and all of the negative outcomes. I mean, you cannot extract this from the state of our health as it concerns the food we eat. They're absolutely entangled, but that's not the message that we're getting at all. The message is this is the evil thing. We'll have, a, we'll have a shot that will protect you from the evil thing. Don't worry about anything else, which is madness because then you look at the actual data and it's all about you know, if you are healthy metabolically, if you don't have comorbid conditions, I mean, those percentages, which are already small for the negative impacts, get minuscule, minute. You, know, you can't even find them with 
you know, night vision binoculars and a, and a scientist who knows how to get needles from haystacks, you can't find it. You know, it's, it's such a minuscule thing, but that's not the message that we're hearing. Yeah. You know, and this is the, the funny thing to me at first, it wasn't funny, but it's funny now because we are under the assumption that things were different. Like we were getting the right information in the first place. <laughs> it hasn't been like that in the first place. Like, why are we surprised? And I was sharing this data, the very opening of this situation, uh, right in, in April, some of the first data coming out, uh, per- published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, they were finding already that upwards of 90% of the folks who were experiencing severe symptoms or losing their lives, upwards of 90% of these folks had one, uh, 50% of them had one comorbidity, the other 50% had two or more, essentially. And those three com- comorbidities or additional causes of death were hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. And so I'm just like, guys, we're in trouble. We, we are a nation that is, inc- we are the sickest nation in the history of humanity, self-inflicted, to be clear, self-inflicted. Mm-hmm. We have over 200 million people who are overweight or obese. Right now, here in the United States, it's a number we can't really even, it doesn't make sense. And within the next 10 years, half of the population will be clinically obese. And this is well known in the data. We have a problem. 60% of the United States population has some degree of heart disease already. 135 million people are type 2 diabetic or pre-diabetic right now. And right now here in America, already about 70% of the population are already on pharmaceutical drugs. But that method hasn't worked. All, everything keeps getting worse. All the problems are worse. And so seeing this data, and I, again, I shared this very early on. I was like, hey, these issues that make us susceptible to all manner of infectious diseases, we have to fix this. And people, a couple of, I mean, of course, the majority of people who we ride with, they're like, yes, this is absolutely true. This is not getting talked about. But there's that small percentage of people. They're like, well, it's too bad we can't get people healthier overnight. Guess what? It's been almost a year now. We're knocking on the door of a year. Wouldn't now be a good time to shift gears and like, let's talk about getting our citizens healthier. It'll never happen. It's never going to be a part of the conversation because it never was. Right. And so the CDC published a, a report, and this was just, just recently, and they affirmed what I said in the very beginning. 94% of the folks who lost their lives with this virus, you know, confirmed cases of COVID-19, 94% of them have an, had an average of 2.6 pre-existing chronic diseases. 94% of them. But because of the framing of the media, we'll just focus on that 6%. Well, healthy, perfectly healthy people are dying too. Wh- what? 94%, can we not talk about this? Can we not talk about it? And so, and actually, of course, like myself, I'll go and actually look at the data. I'll look at the reports. I'll look at the studies. And one of the other factors with that, so these are pre-existing chronic diseases and or, and or comorbidities. And one of the major comorbidities was influenza. And nobody, like the flu just <laughs> disappeared. But it's one of the comorbidities we focus on. It's just like, if it's COVID, it's COVID. It's end of story. And we should be talking about these things. Most importantly, in what I just said, the fact that we're so susceptible because we're already pre, diabetes is an inflammatory condition. Obesity is an inflammatory condition. Heart disease is an inflammatory condition. And this particular virus, you know, what, what, whatever your belief system is around the virus, it, it, it appears to have a tropism towards the lungs, right? Hyperinflammatory responding because it's not your, it's not the, the virus or any virus that creates the inflammation. It's your body's reaction to an exposure that creates, the, your body's doing the inflammation. It's trying, to, it's trying to protect you. And so if you take a pre-inflamed individual and then they become exposed to something that creates hyperinflammation, what do you think is going to happen? But nobody's talking about how can we help to reduce the inflammation that we're experiencing with these chronic diseases because we never did, Aubrey. Like this is just something the system doesn't do. And again, we're like, okay, we're going to get a drug to fix it. We're going to get a drug to fix our problems. And it's just not how stuff works. Just look at the data. You know, that's, that's the thing. And one of your guests before, he's just like, science isn't very scientific right now. <laughs> and like, for me, for me, that just really jumped up. I was like, that's perfectly said. Very simple. 
And, you know, at this time, having data like that, any person who is just having just a modicum of logic and seeing like 94% of the folks who've lost their lives, whatever you believe about this particular illness, had a pre 2.6 pre-existing chronic diseases. And to say like we, like the, the, this is something we can't do something about, to say that this is something that's okay, that our citizens are so susceptible and so sick and just ignore that and take another drug, it is so inappropriate. And we could do so much better. And this was the thing, last thing. I, and I know you did too, and I know many folks listening, we just felt that we were better than this. And we're not, we're not, but we, we are. Let me be clear, we are, but we just don't know it yet. We are so much more. We are so much more capable of understanding and science and compassion and working together. But we, we are, we're really getting to see the worst of us. We're getting to see our worst tendencies. And we're getting to see how strange and twisted things can be, you know, even with the censorship and all this stuff. Science should not be censored. I had on the top uh, cell biologist, you know, uh, epigen- he's really the person who pioneered epigenetics as far as like getting into popular lexicon, Dr. Bruce Lipton. Two of his programs, he put so much into what he does, got taken down, you know, got censored. This he's your favorite cell biologist, cell cell biologist, you know, favorite cell biologist. He's like your rapper's favorite rapper. When we're <laughs> talking about epigenetics, when we're talking about virology, like this guy was in the he's been teaching doctors for decades, you know, about cellular functioning and the immune system. And it's just like, oh, his opinion doesn't matter right now. Shut him up because he has a, a perspective that doesn't fit into the popular narrative. And that's, that's what's really scary for me is the idea that science is fixed, which it never has been, not once. And we're talking about these things that never has been, but all of a sudden science has a capital S and it's a fixed singular opinion. It can't be. The respiration for science, what allows it to breathe, is questioning alternate hypotheses hypotheses, weighing out different theories, looking at different factors, looking at where there's things that we could kind of grab a hold of and start to understand. But when you shut it down and just say, science says, science says nothing. Science is a process. Science is a method. You know, it is not a thing that speaks with a singular voice. It's a chorus of disparate ideas that sometimes find, you know, coherence and sometimes find resonance. But without the whole chorus being heard and everybody looking, you're inevitably going to be steered down the wrong path, as we have constantly throughout history when we said sugar is fine, but fat is bad. I mean, that was one of these cases. And we said, oh, you know, all the ulcers in your stomach, that's caused from stress. And some doctor was like, no, it's not caused by H. pylori. And they're like, shut up. And he's like, I'm telling you, and like, shut up. And then he finally had to drink the beaker himself. And like, this is the way it goes. Like people have to speak counter to the narrative because there was billions of dollars wrapped up in antacids and billions of dollars in all of these treatments. And actually these, you know, these gastric surgeries that were good. The, the machine gets rolling and it's so necessary for there to be these other voices that come out and challenge that. And look at all the different factors. And going back to what we're experiencing now, I just saw a recent study that says there was a correlation between vitamin D deficiency and serious negative outcomes regarding COVID and a strong correlation. Now, correlation isn't causation, you know, but that's something to take a look at. Let's just allow the process. Let's allow everybody to talk about, all right, all right, we see a strong correlation here. What can we do? You know, how can we support our people to make sure that they're not vitamin D deficient? Because there's a good chance that this is playing a part in the system that we have, along with all of the food, along with everything else. And unfortunately, you know, and you got to look at why, and the why is, you know, I think very simple. A lot of people say it's a conspiracy. I don't think it's a conspiracy. It's just a self-serving bias. When you have a giant reward, like the, there's a recent article said 32 billion is going to go to Moderna and Pfizer. You have a $32 billion prize. If you have that in your company, however good your fucking employees are, if you're like, there's a million dollars for someone who can do this thing, guess what? It's going to challenge them. They're going to, maybe a few won't abide by it, but some will. It's just self-serving. You'll be able to shift your understanding of how the world works and what morality is and what's right. It'll just filter through your brain in a way that's going to serve you in the best way. So no conspiracy necessary. 
no deep state necessary. Maybe it exists. I don't fucking know. But it's not necessary. All you have to know is that people are going to look at the way that the world is in a way that's going to serve them the best. And I think that's really what we're experiencing here. But people aren't seeing that, you know, at the very simplest level. Yeah, I, I love what you said, man. Science is a process. And throughout history, we continue to really go at the throat of people who uh, go against the popular narrative with science, even though they have, quote, science to back up and affirm what they're saying is real. You know, like there were things taught in universities that were absolutely absurd today, you know, about, for example, where, where we fit in the galaxy, you know, stuff revolving around us. Like the guy's like, you know what? Actually, the sun's the center of the, sorry, <laughs> kill him. They're like, no, he's got to go kill him. He can't be, you know what? And same thing, you know, today, one of the holy trinity of protection is to wash your hands. Dr. Inez Semmelweis, he's the one who brought that forward. And the medical establishment went after him. They called him a lunatic. They said it was no grounds. And he, stu he studied it. He reported. He did tests. He tracked and he found out, hey, guys, maybe after we're tinkering with these dead bodies and then we're like going and, you know, giving birth, you know, helping women to give birth. Maybe we might want to, you know, put a little, put a little water on our hands, wash a little bit of that off, you know? And they were just like, this is, this is the way we've done it. This is the way it's always been done. What are you talking about? And so, but now today it's become Well, and just to finish, that, they threw him, they threw him in a loony bin where the people in the, in the, in the loony bin were beating him and eventually wounded him. And then he, they believe that he died of sepsis because the people who were fixing the lacerations from him getting beaten for having this crazy idea that you should wash your hands after doing an autopsy before delivering a fucking baby, which is like obvious to us now, but they didn't have that understanding that germs could transfer. He thought it was little dead, little pieces of dead person that were on people's hands, which is actually pretty kind of accurate, you know, like little, the bacterial pieces right. of the dead body of the decaying process were being transferred to these mothers. They threw him in a loony bin, they beat him, and then they didn't wash their hands when they were treating him and he died of sepsis. I mean, how fucking horrible and ironic is that? But that's science with a capital S acting in a fascist and oppressive way. And there's a litany of examples of that. And I think yeah. we're gonna look back you know, 10, 20 years from now, whatever, five, maybe three, who the fuck knows, we'll be like, Dang, dang, you know, like so we the, really, the question we is, really fucked up. The question is, what are we doing that about right now? What are we doing that same thing? Because the popular narrative and what we talked about in the last episode, you know, because when the, the, the treatment for what we're dealing with came along, you know, this holy trinity, hand washing, social distance, and wear a mask, I just went into the data. I wanted to find, I wanted to make sure that the masks are going to be an effective prevention metric without venturing into the ridiculous. And I might've shared this, or maybe it happened after we talked, but my neighbor, this was a 108 degree day. He went from his car, he's in his late twenties. He doesn't have an autoimmune disease. He went late twenties, early thirties, walked from his car, from his house to his car, full on gas mask with the whole, the, the two things right here, head to toe clothing, gloves, boots, mask couldn't see anything with his face because he had the gas mask on because of fear just to go from his door to his car wow. and I'm, I'm just like is that is this is what what are we doing here is this actually based on reality or are we going too far and so i went to the data to find out what are the most effective metrics here so we can utilize mask in a way that makes sense without venturing into the ridiculous and creating a culture around us where this is a norm based on based on assumption or superstition and not based on science. And so I went into the data looking for like, okay, how can I find ways that this actually works? And I just kept being surprised over and over again because the randomized controlled trials, we already had pretty good data on this. Randomized controlled trials, this is the gold standard because we're looking at a specific intervention and a specific outcome versus what is being pressed in popular culture, popular media, these are based on theoretical models. This is based on theory. It's because we can see the, the, the image of like the, when you're breathing out and like you could see the mass is preventing the aerosols and droplets. 
And it's just like, look at it, see, clearly it works. But then how does this play out in the real world? Because here's the thing, if you can also see in that same uh, special fancy imaging, if you could see the number of viruses that are actually in that room, you couldn't see anything else but viruses. We're swimming in them. There are hundreds of trillions. That number isn't even big enough. Just in the room that you're in right now, it's covering your entire body. You cannot, it is the most permeate. In, as far as things here on this planet, there are more viruses than anything else on earth. And we just don't get it. We're doing that thing where, it's, like you said, it's a big ass capital of science. And we're not understanding the basic tenet of how viruses exist in our world. We've become afraid of something that's invisible. And it's just like, we keep looking, oh, well, we found the thing. We keep looking deeper and deeper and deeper. We found, this is the thing that creates sickness. But the reality is very different. We, as human, when they did the Human Genome Project, mapped us out, we are 8% endogenous retroviruses. <laughs> Even the ability for humans to, to reproduce and to have a placenta, that was, that was designed and evolved from the work of viruses. Our immune system is rooted from viruses. Viruses created our immune system that defend us against viruses. These are all basic premises. And then of course, it's just like, well, that's not a pathogenic virus. It's not a novel virus. And that was the thing that we were told in the beginning. We don't have an innate immunity to this. Well, there's also this thing called the adaptive immune system. And this is why even as today, it's about 65 million confirmed cases of COVID, which again, that's all that is debatable, I get that. I'm just going with the numbers so we can communicate and what the popular narrative narrative is. 65 million confirmed cases, about 1.6 million folks have lost their lives, which by the way, sidebar, they've been relegated to numbers, a little ticker, a little stock market ticker on the news. That people, and I was just with some folks, they don't even see it. It's become like, it's become normalized to them. I was like, guys, you don't see the number? They're like, no, I didn't even, I didn't even notice because they sit and watch the fucking news. And so, 65 million people, 1.6, 1.7 million folks have lost their lives. We don't say shit about the 64, 63 million people who are okay. We don't say anything about them. It, it's like it doesn't even exist. How do they survive? They didn't get the vaccine. They didn't, it didn't come out yet. How did they make it? They have an immune system. It's what, you're, it's what we're designed to do and we're being taught, we're treated, we're training an entire generation of humans with our children to, to not trust their bodies. We're, we're training them to believe that they are not enough. When most mm. folks honestly wouldn't have even known that this was a thing if it didn't have such a great system behind it. So many folks would have just went on about their lives and never realized that there was this thing going around. And what does the fear do? How has the fear affected our outcomes? And that's why I had Dr. Bruce Lipton on again. Renowned cell biologist, pioneer in epigenetics. His voice matters. His perspective matters. His science, what he's teaching, controls the rest of the sciences below it. And he shared the biology of fear and what happens. He went through step by step by step and showed it is one of the most powerful forces for suppressing our immune function when you are afraid. And you've already, pre, you've already taken the nocebo that if you get exposed to this, if you even start to have symptoms, even if you don't have it, your outcomes are going to be worse. You could die. Being sick is no longer okay. People used to say, even if you sneeze, like you used to sneeze, people were like, oh, bless you. Now, if you sneeze, people are like, fuck you. God, fuck you. What happened? Like we were so afraid of the just really basic human functioning and our ability to operate in our environment. And part of that too, Aubrey, and just like saying the thing out loud, we don't understand that we are a part of nature. Amen. We have created this veil that separates us, but it's, it's still, you could try and hide. You are a part of nature. There is no other animal out here running around trying to hide from something invisible. We've lost touch. And the great thing about us, this is the, the beauty about humans though, is that we can find, we can research and dig in and find the things that are happening behind the scenes but we don't want to go to such an extreme that we're trying to kill all the, the viruses and the bacteria, not realizing that we are mostly that. We are made of over 400 trillion viruses that make us up. Many of them will kill you. They're pathogenic or what we call opportunistic. 
We are carrying around things that can kill us just as fast, if not faster, right now. But if our immune system is not compromised, we're okay. And the question is, why do we carry those things? Everything has a role. There's a symbiotic nature. There's a symbiotic relationship. Some of these things, some of these viruses might be assisting in creating, you know, scaphas for your gastrointestinal tract. They might be in assisting your immune function. They might be assisting in your ability to, to see. These are all things that we will learn as the years go on. And we'll, we keep coming to this place of like, actually, viruses are not as bad as we thought. They're actually very helpful. There are opportunistic things, but we need to keep things in balance. We've, we've swung so far to the other side, we're trying to kill everything. And we, knew what, we know what happens when we did that with bacteria. The average human, and this is in Eat Smarter, and this is the beautiful part about Eat Smarter. This, is, this book is going to be at every Target store in America. It's going to be everywhere. And people are going to finally get, because there's a virility to books, mm. they're going to get access to this information. And one of the things that I talk about that's directly correlated with our decline in health, but also our incline in obesity is related to, uh, is related to the decline in the diversity of our bacteria. It's direct. It's, it's, we got hard data on this. The average person here in America looking at the microbiome diversity of somebody who's eating more of an indigenous diet, hunter-gatherer, they have four times to 10 times more diversity in their gut than we do. We, the analogy of looking at your microbiome like a, a rainforest, we have a lot of endangered species and a lot of stuff has gone extinct for us. And that has led directly, and we can talk more about this, of course, when there's a decline in your diversity of, micro, of microbes, you, there's a direct increase in your rate of obesity. And also, all manner of chronic diseases, your susceptibility skyrockets when the diversity goes down. We've spent the past few decades trying to kill microbes, trying to kill bacteria, trying to kill pathogens, things that we can't see. Not realizing that when we drop that antibiotic into our gut, which I've been prescribed antibiotics myself when I didn't have a bacterial infection. Mm. This is common. It's still common today, even after all this. But just imagine for the decades prior. I would have patients coming into my office who've been on antibiotics for skin issues, for example, auto, autoimmune related skin issues for 20 years. 20 years on antibiotics, like that's okay. If it's an antibiotic, it doesn't care what jersey the bacteria is wearing. It's coming to kill. It's coming to kill. It's like dropping a little, little, little microbe nuke off in your gut. You know, and, and of course, there's the clue is in the name antibiotic, anti life, anti-life. you know, and then the, the, we don't realize that all of these things that we're trying to kill is us too. And that's this point that you're making. And that's like it, it can become a metaphysical, spiritual point where you recognize the unicity and oneness of all things. But it's also a materialist reductionist point as well that we're carrying all this shit. We have cancerous cells, we have pathogenic cells, we have deadly viruses. We have all of the things within us. We are in homeostasis with everything, hopefully. And sometimes we get out of balance, which is a signal. Okay, we're out of balance. And this entire thing that's happening in the collective is that gentle pressure that maybe not so gentle, actually, but it could have been a gentle pressure to remind us, hey, we got to take care of ourselves. Like if we're not healthy, there's things that are going to be even more out of balance. We're not going to be able to respond even to a threat that we should be able to respond to. So let's restructure society. Let's go back to the science of food. Let's understand how we can support ourselves. Talk about getting the right amount of vitamin D and sunshine. Talk about exercise. Talk about this. Let's let this be a fucking rallying cry for probiotic factors. Not only the probiotics that go in your gut, but pro-life. What's pro-life? Good sleep, great food, good sex, good exercise, con- physical connection, you know, a sense of belonging and tribe and purpose. Okay, but we didn't quite take that opportunity this time, so we took the other off ramp. But for, for many of us, it is that wake-up call. And, and I think that's the beautiful part. You know, we're starting to see more people now because of everything, just recognizing how important this is. So there's no accident that your book came out the time that it did, because this is, you know, in many ways, this is the vaccine that's going to work and is not going to fuck you up in any way as the cost of it working, you know, like this is just all helpful. 
And, uh, and that's the beautiful aspect. Of it. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. I'm just, and I believe this as well. Like we get to decide what we're about, you know, like we could take on the belief that we were like, I was born, I, I was brought here for this. You know, I, I choose to take on that belief. I was brought here for this moment. I've been weathered, you know, I've been, this is, this is nothing to me to face adversity. I've been doing this since the day I was born, you know, and, and I mean that very literally, like when I was born, I had, you know, they had to actually break my feet. And this is common for actually it's the degree though, was so bad with my feet being bent and I had to be put in the cast. And so they told my mother that I might not be able to walk normally, you know, that whole story. And I remember, man, like being an infant, not, not like baby, baby, but like, I remember banging my legs up against the couch, having these braces on my legs, right? I was on my Forrest Gump shit, all right? But like Forrest Gump, like high school, 15 years old, I ran a four five forty, you know, and everything was looking good. My aspirations for, you know, playing at the next level. And it's just kind of like folks started to rally around me, like Sean's that guy. And but my, but my body started to break down. And I was made, I was making my body, my tissues. I broke, I was at track practice that same year that I ran that four five forty, doing a 200 meter time trial. And I was just running, just me and my coach and my hip broke because my body was so deficient. My bones were just degenerating. And instead of the physician, the system, the, the way that it's structured, it's just standard of care. Stay off the leg, take some NSAIDs, you know, Here's, you gave me like some ultrasound treatment, which by the way, that's super cool, by the way, sound. Mm -hmm. Sound can heal you? But that's a whole other conversation. Yep. But here's the thing, nobody stopped to ask, how did a kid 15 years old break his hip from running? Nobody asked that question. And it goes back to the thing we started the show with, Your, our bodies are made of the things that we eat. And I grew up in an environment where I didn't know that there was a difference. As many people listening, they feel the same way when they grew up. Like my family had no idea. I come from a family of folks who are obese, diabetic, heart disease. I've lost so many loved ones, you know? And we all, we just ate. We just, we didn't know that there was a difference. I didn't know the difference between a fish stick and wild caught salmon. Like it's just stuff you eat. And also to take that even further in the environment that I eventually found myself in as a child, um, you know, we were on food stamps, we we're getting food from like shelters and, you know, food pantries, things like that. I, I mean, I had the worst of the worst, but on paper, like the government was like women, infant and children program, the WIC program, like these are the things you need, like to have healthy kids. It's all fortified with vitamins and minerals. But the reality was also the, the, the structure of food in our, in our country, and this is also something I talk about in the book. So people, because I think we often don't realize this, the reason that I could have went then and went to McDonald's and got a meal for $3, fries, burger, soda, and a little snack and a little fucking toy for $3, but then an avocado cost $3. Something that's so energy intensive to create, that burger and all this, the soda, all the manufacturing, all the processing, all that goes, it's so energy intensive and expensive to do. How could it possibly be the same price as, as an avocado that can essentially fall off of a tree, right? How? And it's really because of the economies of scale. It's because of investments in our, by our government that's looking out for us into big food corporations. And so government subsidies, they provide hundreds of billions of dollars. And I went and actually, I just, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very much like, show me the money, like Cuba Gooding Jr. vibe to me, you know, like I, I got, let me see, show me the money. Yeah. Because I don't wanna just like make assumptions. And so I went and looked at it and I could not believe how much money our government invested into these subsidized crops, right? So mainly like wheat, corn, which is used massively for sugar, and then factory farmed animals. And being that this is the case, again, hundreds of millions of dollars, and I wanna share this with everybody today, and this is direct from Eat Smarter. I went in, I wanted to find out, okay, 
So we know we have these subsidized crops. Does this actually affect our health? Do we have any data on this? And boy, did we. So they actually looked at folks who had the largest consumption of these government subsidized crops that largely show up through the drive through window. These are largely what's found in processed foods. Now, I want everybody to really get this. After adjusting for m major socioeconomic factors like age, sex, uh, and, and countless other variables, they found that the folks who had the highest consumption of, cons of subsidized foods had nearly a 40% greater risk of being obese. This directly translated over these subsidized crops that our government is investing in, literally hundreds of billions of dollars, is directly showing up as a 40% increase in the risk of being obese by eating these same foods that they're investing in. And it, it might've even started, and this is the thing about me, it's always balanced. It might've started with good intention to feed Americans, but the money going to farmers growing fruits and vegetables is nil, it's almost nothing. These commodity crops are getting all the money. And this is what people are largely eating, whether mm -hmm. we realize it or not. It's just that usually- drives, go to It drives the store. cost efficiency, right? Like that subsidy drives the cost efficiency, drives the economy of scale, which then allows there to be that 99 cent burger, you know, because it's subsidized beef on subsidized wheat on subsidized with subsidized corn syrup with subsidized everything. And so it allows something to actually be cheap when, and that's, a, I think that's the beautiful point that you're making. What happens if we had subsidized avocado? And that's where it gets really curious because the research, at least the mainstream understanding of the benefits of fat, especially the fat that comes from avocado and how actually, if you just wanted to have an avocado, it's one of the best things that you could possibly do, have an avocado and some sea salt. All right, maybe you'll shift over into ketosis, which is fine. Like we'll all be good. And actually that might be a nice restart for our metabolic health, even if that's all we had. Like if I had to pick one food, it was like, bro, all you got is one food for a month. It's like, oh yeah, avocado, easy. You know, I'll jump into ketosis. It'll you know, it's not what I normally eat, but it'll be good for me and I'll be fine. I'll come out of that after the month. And, you know, obviously you know, there's different micronutrients that I'd certainly want to support myself with. But if that was like the one main food, that would be it. But there's not that awareness because we're still stuck in an old paradigm of like the bottom of the food pyramid being, you know, these grains and then not even worrying about. So what you're saying is we are made up of what we eat, but what we eat is made up of what they eat which is made up of what that eats. And even a plant has to eat the vitamins and minerals from the soil in a way, I mean, you know, bring all that up. And then it's just fertilizer and, you know, all of the things that kill all the crops, all of the different, <clears throat> all of the different contaminants that are put in to keep the crops alive. So it, we have to follow the chain all the way back to the beginning of the cycle to understand this, this whole process and then reevaluate, okay, there's bad science in the government's mind, or at least a bad momentum of bad science. Yeah. You know, this idea of the food pyramid, and then there's no action, there's no compulsion to change. Even though we know better now, we're still doing the same thing because momentum has taken over. Because if there is a fucking avocado subsidy, and it was like, listen, <laughs> free avocados for everybody, you know? People would be getting super creative with avocados, and they'd be like thriving with it, and they're like, all right, I'm into this. And like that one thing, could change the metabolic health of the nation like that. But it has to be the mission of the system in and of itself. Right. And when I said subsidy earlier, and also saying that our government is investing, what that really means is we are paying for it. That's the catch. We are paying for it. And if we start to understand our power and we demand, because a lot of these folks in these political offices, they're just, they're just it's a popularity contest. They're just wanting to be liked. They want to do whatever it takes to be in that position. They will address the issues that you demand, you know? And so this is what I'm directing folks to as well. It's like, here's some actionable things that we can actually do to help shift the momentum of this thing. And I think you also brought up another point, like even, you know, terms like ketosis and looking at the different types of foods. We've gotten into this place, and I know a lot of folks here in this community, we're like infighting about minutia when the vast majority of folks are still based, basing their reality, their diet on that food pyramid. I was one of those guys. I was in a conventional university auditorium, nutritional science class, learning this shit. I was told to tell patients I work with to eat seven to 11 servings of grains a day. 
My teacher was overweight. My teacher was, he came in the door, his belly came in first. That's the first thing I noticed. But in my mind at the time, I'm just like, oh, he can't. I, I related nutrition to fitness. I was like, he can't tell me how to be fit. I didn't know. I, I didn't know. But even, and the thing is, he was incredibly smart. But he was, and I know he got stuck in these same patterns that we got to talk about right now of doing the thing he's teaching and hurting himself and trying to keep doing it harder and harder and harder because this must be the way that it works. This is what I was told. And so when a diet is not working for us, even if, especially if it works for a time, and then all of a sudden it stops working or we start to have negative results, we're just like, I'll just do it harder. It's me. It's my fault. I'll just paleo harder. I'll vegan harder. I'll keto harder. Instead of looking at like, hold up, I'm a, I'm a unique, I have a unique metabolic fingerprint that has never existed before in human history. This cascade, what I have, and it will never exist after me. As a matter of fact, the metabolic fingerprint that I have today is not going to be the same as it will be next week. We are incredibly dynamic and fluid and changing. Health is incredibly dynamic and fluid and changing. And we tend to put ourselves, and these diet frameworks are wonderful. They have been life-saving and life-changing for countless millions of people. But we do not want a framework to become our prison. We have to do what's right for us. And so I wanted to create a book that was a unifier of all of the best frameworks and also targeting what are the specific things on whatever diet framework we have that are directly, directly causative of excessive fat gain or directly causative of heart disease or diabetes. And we went through all those things. And so one of the biggest things that we have to get past as a society today and that, man, I love this. And we talked about this before we got started. Like, we're into these shows that have like this, like, graceful inter intrication or, or input of history, right, built into it. You were talking about uh, The Last Kingdom on Netflix and that story of the, you know, the Danes coming in, the UK and all that. And Uhtred of Bevenbeck, right? We're talking about <laughs> Uhtred, you know? And... I, I'm such, even right now, I'm just wired up this way. I ask, where did this come from? When I hear an idea, when anybody's talking about anything, I immediately think like, where did that come from? Right? Just the most random things. And so this term calorie, and I really got face to face with it for the first time. I was, when I was in my college class, this was the monarch. This was the, 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 the emperor. This was the warden of all nutrition is the calorie. Calories in, calories out. That's it, you do it and you're, and you're good. Now here's the thing, the history itself, this is what we need to know. Where do these ideas come from? When the calorie was discovered, just by the way, if we just wanna use our own basic logic and just kind of what we've seen, when we see the, the, the pyramids and the hieroglyphics, there, was not, there wasn't shit about a calorie. Hippocrates wasn't talking about count, you count your calories, right? Food is medicine, medicine, food, count your calories. It wasn't a thing. Nobody was looking for it when it was discovered. As a matter of fact, it was used in physics and engineering. It wasn't even look, we weren't looking for a measurement of food, energy. And eventually, you know, it was Wilbur Atwater who kind of transitioned it into nutritional, the nutritional domain. And I go through and take everybody through the process because there's other steps here. But here's where it really got crazy. A woman named Dr. Lulu Hunt Peters. If you want to know why the calorie is the dominant factor in American diet or just diet in general in the world, it's largely thanks to Dr. Lulu Hunt Peters. And she's a pioneer, absolutely. And she wrote a book in the early part of the 1900s that basically, and by the way, it was a massive bestseller. This book sold 2 million copies. At this wow. time, it's basically like everybody and their sister had this book for real. All right. So, when we talk about the permeation of ideas and culture, this is really one, one that changed the entire outcome of our society. And so this was a time, and I went back and actually read her old fangled writings, and I just I was shocked that some of these things were being impressed upon our culture. This was when food went from being this very dynamic, multifaceted entity that literally creates our heart, that creates our brains, enabling us to have thought and feeling and emotion. Uh, that makes up our mitochondria, that creates the energy for us, that creates, again, the very heart that's beating in our bodies made from the food we eat. It went from being this multifaceted dynamic thing to being numbers. 
And she said, you will, from here on out, you will no longer eat food. You will eat calories of food. You will no longer eat a slice of bread. From now on, you will eat 100 calories of bread. You will no longer eat a slice of pie. From now on, you'll eat 350 calories of pie. And she maintained that a woman of her height could eat whatever she wanted as long as she ate 1,200 calories a day. And she battled with her weight her entire life. That's the part that's left out again, just like my teacher. Just like my teacher. She was doing the thing, but it was not working. And she, she also impressed upon our culture. This was also, this is what she did to herself. This is where it was integrated in our culture, associating food with morality. And if you can't do this, it's a character defect. This isn't something wrong with the, with the nutrition approach. It's something wrong with you. And there were words in, in these writings like punishment and sin. And also, this was the first time that it was impressed upon culture that hunger is the target. If you're hungry, you're doing it right. And she said, this was during the time there was like food rationing, right? World War I. She said, if you're, when you're hungry, when you experience a hunger pain, you should have a double joy knowing that you're saving the hunger pains in another person. And creating this belief structure in our world based on deprivation, restriction, and punishment, and seeing food as numbers, and we're still doing that shit, and I'm fucking tired of it. It doesn't work. It yep. doesn't work. And so that chapter, we're about to turn that page. I'm done. I'm done. Food is so much more than a caloric measurement. And as a matter of fact, what I did was I went and I found five specific things that actually control what calories do in your body. And every health expert that's promoting, all you need to do is calorie deficit, calorie deficit, and you'll get there. No, we've got the data now and everybody's going to know this. It's good because, you know, obviously there's a lot of a lot of things that I wrote about and own the day that are similar to what you're writing about here, you know, because we cover nutritional the diversity of food and even one of my chapters, eat a, eat a weird lunch. And it's encouraging people to go reach for those foods that are outside of the box, those things that they haven't tried. Maybe it's oysters or maybe it's, you know, something even more odd. Like I just had, you know, Paul Saladino in there and he always comes to my house, the carnivore doc, and he has a bull testicle in his backpack and he's always trying to get me to eat that <laughs> slippery thing. And I'm like, nah, bro, like I get it. I'm sure there's nutrients in that testicle, but like, I just can't, man. I love you, but I fucking can't. But nonetheless, like I, if I was really that committed to getting those nutrients, for sure, eat that raw bull testicle that he just, you know, that he just harvested or whatever. But, you know, these ideas about, going and grabbing all of these other food sources, paying attention to your macronutrient profiles, making sure that you're supporting yourself with enough fat. I'll put some of this stuff out and reliably somebody will say, this is all bullshit, man. This is all bullshit, bro. It's calories in, calories out. It's been decided. Science has determined it. And uh, you don't need to talk Dude, about this shit. Let's, let's talk about this right now. Unbelievable. Listen, first of all, shout out to Paul Saladino. He's like the 2020 door of the explorer, right? <laughs> Bull sack, right? Yeah, yeah. Pulling it out. Map, I'm the map. Anyways, so here's <laughs> one of the coolest things. And this is something that's been kicked around for a while. Like, it's the quality of foods. It's not just the, the calories. It's the quality of the calories. Now we know for certain, all right? We got some really great data on this. So this was published in the journal Food and Nutrition Research. And they want to find out what happens when folks, to, to their calorie expenditure, when they eat a meal of whole foods versus a meal of processed foods. And what they deemed to be a meal of whole foods was whole grain bread and cheddar cheese. All right, so they had some test subjects to eat their whole food sandwich versus a meal of processed food, which was deemed to be white bread and cheese product. And cheese product, that's craft. All right, that's what craft is. They can't legally call their shit cheese because there's not enough cheese in the cheese. All right, so these two sandwiches, so folks eat, eat uh, either of these two sandwiches on paper. The sandwiches are the same amount of calories, same amount of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. But here's what happened after they compiled all the data. The folks who were eating the processed food sandwich had a 50% reduction in their calorie burn after eating that sandwich. It, it created a hormonal clog. It changed the way their metabolism was working so their body was less apt to expend the energy that they consumed. It changed what their metabolism, metabolism was doing because of the quality of food that they were eating these foods that were so far, so far from what's normal, so far what's from what's natural, from, so far from what your genes expect you to eat, 
that it changed their metabolism, creating these hormonal clogs. So again, same amount of calories on paper, but we have a problem, Houston, for real. Like we've got a real problem. And that's just one factor. That's the type of food. And I actually take people through, it's called the DM, all right? It, it goes down in the DM. That's, that's the acronym for this. Uh-huh. And what it is, is, be, is because of the underlying premise that your hormones are such a powerful entity in this conversation that's overlooked too often. Your hormones are essentially chemical messengers that are communicating data throughout all the trillions of cells that you have. And when there is miscommunication here, you know, they're sending metabolic DMs, you know, metabolic text messages and emails and, you know, pings. But when those messages start to, for example, if you look at leptin, right, leptin is well noted to be our body's major satiety hormone and it's produced by our fat cells. It's this poetry in nature. And so if you have excessive amount of fat on your body, you should be pretty satisfied all the time. Aha, that's not how it works. Because now that you have so much more fat mass, you're producing a lot of insulin, but it's like getting flooded with spam. It's like getting flooded with messages that are going to spam now. Your body's not even picking it up. There's a resistance to it, right? That's where leptin resistance comes in because there's so much of it happening, right? So to fix these things, and I call this the DM, in addressing how calories are actually controlled in our body, that type of food is the first thing. The second thing is with the H, is how the food is prepared also affects our ability to absorb or not absorb calories from our food. And anybody who's really looked at the kind of the evolution of the human brain will tell you that arguably the the biggest jump, like the quantum leap in the development of the human brain was thanks in in part to our ability to cook food. Because suddenly we were able to extract so much more nutrition or so much more Caloric energy, it still matters. Calories do, we can use it as a, a some part of our lexicon to communicate, but now we're able to absorb and to, and to get in energy from foods we never could have gotten energy from before. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, cooking our food changes how your body associates with the calories or the energy you consume. And that's not there on your product label. It doesn't talk about that. And just to give people a really quick snapshot on this, if we look at one of the hottest foods, I mean, I think it's kind of like died off a little bit, but kale was popping. I mean, kale, people have the shirts. Yep. You know, Paul Saladino got a ball in his bag. He does not have kale, right? <laughs> for some that's folks, a, kale is a, like the holy grail. For other folks, it's just like it's a, it's, it's a killer, you know? Um, but kale was just very popular. And now here's the thing. When you cook kale, no, I think this is the first premise. The older the plant is, the sturdier the cell wall. And so you're going to be less able to extract calories from the food. So the younger kale, like baby kale, baby spinach, automatically, boom, you can extract more energy. Or if you cook it, you break down the cell wall and now you can extract a lot more calories. And the density, because you go from like two, three big batches of, of, or bunches of kale and you cook it, now you've got like a tiny little bowl, right? So the volume affects everything. So how the food is prepared mattered. And then the E, E is energy exchange, and it costs calories to absorb calories. This is not on the product label. I was taught this in school, but not like this, not in a way that actually applies to the real world. Proteins, when you eat a protein, you're gonna use about 20 to 30% of the energy, of of the calories that you consume to digest that protein. So if you consume 100 um, calories of protein, all right, 100 calories of protein, you're going to burn about 30 calories to digest that protein. You got to take these complex protein structures and break them down in amino acids. All right, that matters. So the, it's the thermic effect of food. Carbohydrates, you're going to use about 10 to 15% of the calories you consume to digest those carbohydrates. For fats, in the ballpark of zero to 5%. Our bodies are very good at digesting fats. All right, shout out to the, the gallbladder, the liver. You know, we, we're just, we're very good at digesting fats. Now, with that said, looking at what, what are we debating most about today, Aubrey, for the last couple of years, again, the, the minutiae, we're debating fats and carbohydrates the most. And nobody's saying shit about protein, barely, right? Proteins is like Roddy Dangerfield, you know, like, <laughs> again, no respect, you know, it's just, <laughs> but it's so important because of the thermic effect of food. And also we evolved eating dense protein source foods 
but we have this, we've been inundated with this idea that Americans are consuming way too much protein. And I went and looked at the data and what do you know? It's not true. It's not true. There are populations of people who are consuming what would be considered too much, but the quality of that protein matters, right? If they're eating protein like I was when, when my body was breaking down, my hip broke, dude, if I got up in time, I'm hitting McDonald's. I'm getting that, I'm getting that sausage biscuit. I'm starting the day with the sausage biscuit. I'm getting the, the, the they had the um, 99 cent triple cheeseburgers. All right. I'm hitting that bad boy. I'm doing the stacker, you know, the KFC stacker. You got the bun, the two buns are actually chicken, fried chicken patties in it. You know, so I'm, I'm eating like this. I'm eating these processed, low quality, factory farmed, diseased versions of these foods, right? That matters. So those are the three. And then the last two really quickly. So that was going down to the DM. These are controlling what calories are doing in our bodies. Oh, and also the Atwater, there's a great study that I shared. On the product label, 170 calories of almonds, for example, you only get a net gain of about 129 from those almonds that you just ate, right? Your body's using energy to extract that energy, all right? It's not accounted for. All right, so the E is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, T-H-E-D, the D is digestive efficiency. And this goes back to our metabolic uniqueness. Every one of us, if Aubrey and I eat the same meal, him and I both can have hundreds of calories difference, even if we're eating the same amount of calories and how much our bodies absorb, and expend hundreds of calories difference. And we're not, as far as like our leanness, body composition, we're not that far off. But our digestive efficiency based on the enzymes that you're producing, based on your bile, based on your stomach acid, based on your microbes, all of these factors are determining how you're able to extract nutrients from your food and also burn or store those nutrients. And this is not talked about enough. If there's like even a modicum of thyroid dysfunction, it can reduce your rate of calorie expenditure by hundreds of calories a day. It's just, that's just one factor. All right. So that's. I got to jump in here because there's something I read in your book, which I've always instinctively really believed about myself. There's this idea about you have a fast metabolism and everybody's always told me I have a fast metabolism, whatever the fuck that means. But really, I started to understand and, and intuitively understand, especially, and you list this study as well, when they started replacing the gut biomes of certain mice, mice that were overweight with mice that were skinny, and they replaced them. And then the skinny mice that got the gut biomes of the overweight mice became overweight. And so basically changed the, quote, metabolism of these mice based upon you know, the gut biome. Because what people are talking about with metabolism, they're talking about if you eat this much food, will you get fat? Like that's colloquially what metabolism is. And I cannot, I cannot put on weight. And so I'm thinking about this and this mysterious thing called metabolism. Like what I know is that I can eat a bunch of food, but my body doesn't absorb that much food. You know, like for whatever reason, I can just keep eating and my body just will not turn it into fat storage. It just won't. And the only thing that makes sense is that I'm not absorbing it. And you just go right into it and you actually name I think it's a mucinithalis or something like that. You actually talk about this thing that I had always intuitively, you know, like I got something that prevent that is different than other people. I get it, but it's not this mysterious metabolism. There's a reason for it. How powerful is that? That this term fast metabolism, the same here. This is the thing that I've been told as well is actually rooted in your, your microbiome, your gut bacteria specifically. And this is really at the heart of it. And so this is actually the M. So the DM, T-H-E-D-M is your microbiome makeup. Has a massive impact on your body's ability to absorb and store and utilize calories. And so one of the studies that you're highlighting, this was published in the journal Cell. And they discovered there's a certain bacteria in mice that literally block their intestines from absorbing as many calories. But our conventional science will be like, let's get that bacteria and put it in a pill and try and get people, and people to want it. Like I want my body to, people to, they're drinking, you know, they're swallowing tapeworms, you know, to try to prevent yeah. their body from absorbing as many calories. It would be the hottest thing smoking, but will it work now? So here's the thing, of course, we're not mice. In human studies, this was published by the Wiseman Institute, and I talk about this as well. We know, and when people would come into my office, if I had them to get a stool sample, and I can look at their report if I never even saw them before. If I never saw the person and I see their 
their, their, their report from their stool sample, I can determine whether or not they're obese before I even see them based on their bacteria cascade. This is well known now. And so the, the Wiseman Institute knows that there's a certain bacteria spectrum or bas- bacteria cascade that's associated with obesity and diabetes. And so they took these ba- bacteria samples from folks who were obese, or these quote fat bacteria, and they implanted them into mice. They took the fecal sample, sample and put them into lean mice. And they also took samples from lean human test subjects and put them into mice. The mice that got the fat bacteria from obese human subjects gained weight, gained body fat, and became insulin resistant, while the mice receiving the healthy human samples did not. Now, we stretch this out even further into human, the human uh, test subjects. They took identical twins, identical twins, all right? They're supposed to be identical, right? Now, <laughs> I just saw a meme today. It was just like, uh, folks who are twins that aren't identical twins, it's just like, what was the point of that? You know, what was, what was the point? <laughs> but anyway, shout out to all the twins. Shout out to all the twins. Uh, but they took identical twins and they were able to look at their bacteria cascade. And when they found a twin that had a noticeable increased ratio of these, quote, fat bacteria, you know, most associated with obesity and diabetes, they tracked them. And even though they're in the same household eating the same diet the, and they're identical twins, The twin who had the bacteria cascade associated with obesity and type 2 diabetes became obese or gained weight, and the other one did not, eating the same diet. Our bacteria matters a lot. That's the very thing that our system of medicine has been trying to kill for decades, kill the bacteria, haphazardly throw some antibiotics in there, antibiotics in our food system, you know, pesticides, herbicides, rodenticides, toxicants, all these different things that damage our bacteria. They're designed to kill small organisms. This is not okay because as the study found, the diversity of our gut bacteria is directly associated with whether or not we're gaining weight. And so the increase, if we can increase our gut diversity, we can dramatically reduce our risk for obesity. And that's one of the things we target in the book too. So what is, so if you're going to break that down, <clears throat> because there's obviously, if you start with identical twins in the same house, there has to be other factors. And maybe that's one of the, one of the twins had an infection and needed a, a big, long course of antibiotics, which then changed the ratio of certain gut bacteria and allowed some to flourish and some to decrease and the other twin didn't. Little things like that can contribute. Maybe one was able to get access to a certain type of snack because they had a certain friend. And they were eating more yep. sugar, right? Like there's little factors that could start to create this divergence from identical to divergent. It's not like, well, it's just bad luck. You know, I mean, that's not the way, that's not the way that this goes. It's, it's, you know, there's factors, there's things. So when you're thinking about those things and someone's thinking about their gut, you know, what are the, what are the basic steps that you can do most importantly to repair your gut? you know, at the point that we're at now to actually get you in that right state where you have the bacteria that's going to control this quote metabolism. Yeah. And this just gets to the heart of it, which is the number one thing that we found to increase the diversity of your microbes is to increase the diversity of the foods that you're eating, which when you say that, it just seems like it's obvious because, and I've been doing, I've been talking about this for 15 years and I would have patients coming in. I was putting people on probiotics the probiotics can't do anything. They cannot proliferate if they don't have their preferred food source, right? What we associate with these, you know, these friendly bacteria, you've got bacteroidetes and firmicutes is like two major kind of camps. The firmicutes are more associated with uh, obesity, right? And so this thing is like, if you want to be firm and cute, you got to reduce the firmicutes. <laughs> I didn't make that shit up. I don't know even why I say that. <laughs> Um, so we want to have a better ratio here, but the thing is the firmicutes are not without their purpose. Everything needs to be in balance and we can create this phenomenon today. And I experienced it myself years ago of gut dysbiosis, right? Something's just off. And this is so common today, but we might not have, uh, you know, when I was a kid, it was just called a tummy ache. Now it's like got all these different names, you know, but we might not have direct quote, tummy symptoms. It might manifest as skin issues. It might manifest as 
uh, pain in your joints. It might manifest as thyroid issues related to what's happening with our microbiome cascade. And we know this is well established now. But for most folks, if they're not experienced, you know, tummy pain, they're, they don't realize they have dysbiosis. And so how do we fix this? We have to provide, and this is category, and today we're really, I want everybody to really get it, prebiotics. We have to provide prebiotics for the probiotics to proliferate and to transform our gut health. And there is data, and I, I just don't believe this, I don't like to talk in extremes, that found that basically some of these extinct bacteria that humans need to really thrive, once they're gone from your system, they're gone. You can't get them back. And I don't, but there is data showing that we can change. And so I just feel we have to really stack conditions in our favor to do it because in our culture, especially if we're doing these different diet frameworks, we might pull out an entire category of foods that our genes, where we come from, our lineage have been having for centuries. And we have a symbiotic, you know, connection with this food that's feeding a certain strain of gut bacteria that now that I pulled this food out because, and I might even feel better because I've taken it out, taken, well, taken it and a bunch of other things out. But now those bacteria that have helped your ancestors to thrive, they had to check out. They, they've been evicted. They're out of there. And so now the diet's been working for a year, but now you're starting to have symptoms. Maybe the weight gain is coming back, even though you're doing the same thing. Maybe you're starting to have symptoms of you know, acid reflux, or maybe you're starting to have pain in your joints. This bacteria cascade that you needed is now parted ways. And so we have to be more judicious. We have to be a little bit more patient and careful about pulling foods out. And I think that the heart, again, the heart of the yeah, story, because elimination, the of the spear, I mean, elimination diet is the go-to, you know, for, for yeah. pretty much it, which is basically eliminate almost everything. And what you're pointing to is like, maybe in an, in a case where you're having such strong inflammatory reactions to food for whatever reasons. And there's a lot of reasons we can get into that you have these inflammatory reactions. Maybe you do need to cut some things out and then get down there for a little while. But as a permanent long-term strategy, you know, if grass-fed beef is the only thing that works with bone broth, okay, great. Like do that for a little while, let your inflammation load drop, but you can't stay there. You can't stay there forever, you know, and well, you can, but there's going to be other consequences for staying there. And I think that's a really good point that you're making. Yeah. And if we just kind of hit the point, hit the needle on the head, uh, with the prebiotics. So there's prebiotics, probiotics, and postbiotics, right? So the postbiotics are the things that your bacteria, viruses, fungi, archaea, these things that they, they, these microbes create things in you for you, the symbiotic relationship. These are the postbiotics. And so the prebiotics being, these are some of the, there's like a camp of prebiotics, which is pretty much every food is going to have prebiotic capacity. But they're generally put like Jerusalem artichoke, asparagus, uh, you know, uh, garlic and onions and, and uh, inulin, you know, from apples and all these different things. But again, these are putting them in this pithy little box. The reality is, as our ancestors would be doing, folks that are eating more of an indigenous diet, they're eating a wide array of foods based on availability. So even if everybody listening, even if you're eating what we consider to be healthy, all of us, we can get caught stuck in a rut, right? Like chicken, rice, broccoli, you know, like chicken, asparagus, uh, quinoa, you know what I mean? Like we can get in these loops. And what I want us to do is just, let's practice adding in another couple of foods each week, right? Let's, w whatever it is, plant and or animal foods. Because again, I don't want to get into the debate about which framework is best. But we do need to diversify the, the food types that we're bringing in to invite in and to support, to help to proliferate. If you're eating, for, for example, fermented foods, fermented veggies, whatever the case might be, it's coming with a prebiotic already, being that it has that fiber along with the food, that's great. But to really proliferate and take hold, they need their preferred food source. All right, so uh, last point. In the data, it's mostly plants, but I'm telling you it's, it's both. It's a both and world here. But if you can increase the diversity of plants, and that's the best data that we have, you increase the diversity of your bacteria. And um, last point here, I think one that a lot of folks are going to be thinking about, hearing about more, is resistant starch coming up here in, in upcoming years. And that's a really interesting one, too. You know, But again, at the end of the day, there's di many different types of fiber types. 
uh, bull testicles. I'm sure, again, it could be a <laughs> prebiotic. It has prebiotic capacities because the bacteria are interacting with that food. Whether you get this yeah. or not, that's where the data is headed. And so if we can have a diversity of foods that we're taking in, more intentionally, we're going to have better outcomes with our probiotics and the postbiotics they're able to make. I, in the research for on the day, I believe that the number was 12, and you can probably you probably came across this, but people, the majority of people in America have 12 foods or under that they eat in a given week, year, whatever, which is like a crazy paltry number when you think about, like, if I make a good sandwich, you know, one of my sandwiches with some avocados and some different meats and a different bread, and I don't eat sandwiches all the time, but I could, I imagine I could get at least eight knocked out in the sandwich, let alone like the thing, like it's not, <clears throat> when you talk about a salad, you know, a good salad, it's going to have 14 right there in the salad with the dressing and the vinegar and, and all of the different vegetables. But to say, to really understand that majority of people have under 12, and then we're wondering why all of these autoimmune conditions are on the rise and why chronic fatigue is on the rise, why people don't have energy and they're overweight and they're metabolically, you know, it's a big, big factor as you go back into the gut. Um, so really great that you're continuing to highlight that because it's absolutely vital. And one of the things that I also, you know, talked about and on the day, which I, you take even farther here, which I love, and I want to get into this, is the research on how the food you eat affects your psychology. And one of the studies that I found was that there's a study done at Israeli parole judges. And what they found was, is that at the longer they went away from the time that they ate their lunch, which was like most people, a high carbohydrate starchy lunch, as their blood sugar dropped, they were less likely to grant parole because they were angry. They were frustrated and they were like, ah, fuck you, stay in prison. You know, but if they were just well fed, <laughs> You know, they were far more likely to grant parole to the prisoners. And so even justice itself was not just. It was based upon what they had. Like, it, like if you go to a judge, instead of pleading your case, like, give them a fucking Snickers and you're more likely to, you're more <laughs> likely to get out. I mean, so it's just really interesting to look at that. And you take that all the way in and found data on relationships, found data on emotional regulation, all kinds of things. So I'd love to dive into that a little bit more, too. Absolutely. You know, I've had so many moments just alone in my office, just flipping out, you know, and like now I get to talk about this stuff because some of these things are just like, why don't we know this? Why are people not talking about this? And one of them was uh, conducted by uh, scientists at Oxford University, and they wanted to look at whether or not nutrition could affect your behavior. And they use a population of young male prisoners, which it's unfortunate. And yet it's like very helpful because it's a ward study. It's like something they can track everything that they're doing. And so they had a, a group of prison inmates that they gave additional nutrition to. And this was in the form of supplementation. And this was vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids. They increased the amount of nutrition that they were taking in in the form of these uh, micronutrients and also uh, essential fatty acids. And then they had folks, another group who were given a placebo. All right. Now here's where it gets really crazy. Three month study. One group's getting in increased nutrition. The other is taking placebo. After they compiled all the data, they found that the prison inmates that were getting increased intake of specific nutrients had about a 40% reduction in behavioral offenses. And they found that the prisoners who were getting increased nutrition at a 37% reduction in violent offenses. Nothing else changed. Nothing else changed. And this is compared to the placebo. They didn't change uh, uh, their routines. They didn't change their anything, just giving them additional nutrients for their brains and cells to work better. And so the study was so, so startling. Another group of researchers, and this was published in the journal Aggressive Behavior, which there's a journal for everything. Who's like, I'm subscribed to aggressive behavior, you know, but the, the research was like, this is, it's impossible. You can't just Im improve somebody's nutrition and reduce the rate, their rates of violence like that. They repeated the study, another group of prison inmates, 34% reduction in violent offenses by increasing the, the amount of nutrition that the folks are getting. We've had other studies that have come out since using food. And guess what? 
same thing, but better, better. All right. Same, same reduction in violent offenses and behavioral issues, but food does it better. And so we start to take this out into the real world. What do we see right now? There's so much infighting. There's so, there's such a lack of an ability to, to think about the bigger uh, issue, you know, like what happens if I take this step to uh, inflict violence or to aggressively go at somebody? We're, these are all issues with what's happening to us with our psychology. And so our ability to perspective take, to have patience and to uh, not just jump to aggression, those capacities are dramatically diminished. And I want to be clear, it's not that it's impossible. It's not that it's impossible if you are diabetic and overweight or experiencing depression or heart disease. It's not that it's impossible to have compassion and to not assert aggression automatically. It's just harder. It's just harder. And like I said at the beginning, we have a nation of extremely sick people. Over 200 million people in the United States are overweight or obese. They're already susceptible to more of these things. And a, state, um, a study from the Ohio State University actually looked at married couples. They wanted to find out what can happen if, you know, if we stimulate, it's pretty easy to get folks' blood sugar low, you know, give them uh, like a you know, high glycemic thing and watch blood sugar spike in a crash. And just based off their blood sugar being too low and the couples having an issue, they were far less likely to resolve the issue and to perspective take if their blood sugar was not normalized. Just by them, this term, quote, hangry, that's some real shit. It's cute, like the Snickers commercial, but for real. And how often do we have problems in our lives with people that we love because our basic needs are not met? You know, we're hungry. And I'd have this check-in. If I ever have an issue with my wife, but it's something you work on, I'm just like, okay. And for her too, I'm like, okay, am I, am I nourished right now? Am I lacking something? Am I sleep deprived? Is she sleep deprived? Is she stressed out? Am I stressed? Because our problems are often rooted in things that are happening with our biology and we just don't realize it. So if we can get folks healthier, if we can get folks more, more nourished in our world today, like I know we can, we can start to have healthier conversations more gracefully. That's, yeah. And it's, it's great to have that awareness to just understand because we always think that there's this over self that is always choosing impeccably and if you if you get angry you just chose that and if you and yes there is some there is agency yes. that we have we have some ability but we don't understand you know and have compassion for all of these other factors that are at play and also the the understand so that's step one to understand so when that person is talking to you you know in that really aggressive nasty way online or maybe confronting you out in the streets because your mask is not covering both your nose and your mouth, which has happened to all of us. I got yelled at. I got yelled at randomly outside, you know, out in, in the Whole Foods when I was coming out of the grocery store immediately, you know, I got to put it on, took it off. And someone was like, please put your mask on, sir. And I was like, oh, and like, it was just like a drive by just like hit me and then, <laughs> and then like, like drove right in. I was like, wow, that was my first experience. I know a lot of people that. But you got to understand that that person, it may not be, they're going to Whole Foods. They probably have enough money to get food, but what are they eating? They may have had something that spiked their blood sugar really quick, dropped their blood sugar really low. And so they could have had plenty of food, food, quote, food, but the way that the, the blood sugar spike and then the insulin dump and then the blood sugar drop goes, they could be really hypoglycemic at that point. And just like you said, hangry, but not because they're not fed, but just because they're on the insulin roller coaster, the blood sugar roller coaster. And at that point, you can start to say, well, all right, you know, that was kind of a dick move to yell at me on a drive by and outside of a store. However, man, maybe he was just, you know, having an insulin dump and he didn't really know right. what that, what effects that might have. So then you can start to have compassion rather than just having universal, you know, Ram Dass level spiritual compassion for all beings, which is great. But if you can have a specific understanding of like, okay, there may be something else specific going on here. Not only that, but it could be his other emotional issues, his own fear, his other, then you can really start to have a deeper level and an easier level of compassion. And I think yeah. that's, it's important to remember. And also compassion for yourself, you know, like really understanding like, oh, wow, maybe I wasn't nourished in the right way. 
And maybe normally what I was capable of doing, I just wasn't capable of doing it then. So let me support myself better. Also learn the lessons. And then you get that really kind of balanced understanding of what it is to be a human. Ah, so good, man. So good. And, you know, just to give for everybody, like, what are some specific things, some specific, specific nutrients or foods? One of the things this was published in the journal neurology that we, cause I, again, I'm very big on practical, like what can we actually do with this? And they were looking at how freaking important I think today more than ever, everybody's got to get this and apply this one thing today. We really do know now how important DHA and EPA are. They are remarkably important for your cognitive function. And so in the journal of neurology, they actually use MRIs and looked at the brains of folks and their intake of DHA and EPA. And they fo- found that folks who got the least amount of DHA and EPA in their diets had the greatest amount of brain shrinkage. So when we're, this isn't like the cold, it's cold outside shrinkage. This is like my brain is starving and dying. All right. This is a serious, serious issue. It's because DHA and EPA, they are in this category of very few nutrients that are able to cross the blood brain barrier and directly create stability and structure and improve the, the, the transduction and communication between your brain cells. It is critical. It is critical. And they found that specifically the folks who ate less than four grams of DHA a day, less than four grams, this is about a teaspoon, had the most, the highest rates of brain shrinkage. So just getting four grams is that, is that minimum effective dose. DHA and EPA specifically, these are absolutely critical. And another study that I mentioned, this was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, found that DHA was directly, directly improved memory and reaction time, double blind placebo controlled trials. It directly makes you smarter. All right. Are we getting enough? And also like, what are the protocols here as well? Because DHA and EPA, most folks attributed to fish and fish oil. That's kind of like the gold standard, but where the fish, for example, like caviar, salmon roe, the fish eggs have upwards of like three to four times more DHA and EPA. Right. So we got that camp. Then what if you're doing a vegan protocol, vegetarian protocol? And this is something that I believe because I didn't dig. I just took it at face value from a professor or from a lecture. There's plant omega threes as well, because DHA and EPA, they're in this category of omega three fatty acids. In the plant form, it's not DHA and EPA. It's ALA. It's different. It's important. It has value, but it's not what's able to cross the blood brain barrier and feed your brain. And the thing is, our bodies need DHA and EPA so much, it can convert some of the ALA you take in from plants into DHA and EPA, but you lose about 80% of it in the conversion process. So for you to get the amount of DHA you need from chia seeds, you're going to have to beer bong that shit. You're going to have to get yourself (laughs) a continuous like infusion of chia seeds all day. And chia seeds create that gelatinous poo. You know, it's like that, that. So you might as well just get yourself a, a Johnny on the spot <laughs> office you know, with some pedals and just pedal around because you're not going to go anywhere. Bottom line is it's that it doesn't equal out. We have yeah. to get a dense source of DHA and EPA. And this makes us to challenge and think about our framework. And I'm not telling you to, to bypass your ethics. There are things we can do, but please know food first. This is what we evolved eating. Whether whatever belief system we have, humans evolved eating these foods. So food first, and actually uh, the, another peer-reviewed study that I put into the book found that just one seafood meal per week did in fact help folks to pre- perform better on cognitive skills tests, more so than folks who ate less than one, all right? So it does show up directly in the data. Fish oil has the most clinical evidence. 99.5% of it is based on fish oil. We're talking about DHA and EPA. Then we have krill oil which has come to the forefront now, astaxanthin's in there, it's a powerhouse. We do have some data on krill oil. It, it's got the stuff, like we can measure it, but also we've got some data in its performance. Then we have algae oils, right? So krill oil is gonna be somewhere where you need to look at your ethics, right? It's a microscopic shrimp, all right? It's, it's teeny, 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 tiny, but you might be like, but it's a shrimp though. Can't do it, <laughs> all right? But you're probably like k- killing more, you know, uh, sentient organisms just swallowing right now, you know, like just what's in the air. So 
algae oil is going to be that full on plant source. But keep in mind, we don't have a lot of clinical evidence of its effectiveness, but that we do know DHA and EPA are there. So that's a good thing. And at minimum, I want folks, if you're doing a vegan or vegetarian, vegetarian protocol, please get yourself a, a high quality source of DHA and EPA. Your brain needs it. This is literally going to protect your brain from accelerated aging and, and accelerated shrinkage. All right. Nobody likes shrinkage. One of my favorite studies on krill oil, because obviously on it makes krill oil. And that was a, an important decision that we wanted to really push into that and find, you know, sustainably sourced, you know, Arctic, Arctic krill. And <clears throat> the reason for that, obviously the, the Arctic waters are some of the cleanest waters. So, and that's really important with all the seafood because there's so much metal in the water and the bigger, the more predatory the fish, the more other fish it eats, the more, you know, the longer it lives, the more toxins it's going to have in its meat. So these krill being microscopic, like you were talking about with baby kale, it's really good, especially coming from clean waters and making sure that we're not depleting, you know, the available krill, which is a food source for the whole ecosystem there. But then you look at then the EPA, DHA ratio and the astaxanthin, and then you see some really favorable things. But then you start to see some other things that show up. And one of my favorite studies talking about what happens in the brain, not only for long term health. But an intervention of three grams of krill oil in the premenstrual period of a woman's cycle prevented like a massive portion of dysmenorrhea, which is all of the, quote, PMS symptoms. And it was just three grams of krill oil. And then all of a sudden, all of these things that people were feeling from the cramps to the agitation, that dramatically reduced. You know, and that's something that people don't think about. Oh, it's just that time of the month. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Accept that with grace. And, you know, there is a certain surrender to that. And of all conditions and of all cycles, all seasons that we're in, obviously, I'm not a woman, so I can't speak specifically, but that's a universal. Accept, you know, that with grace, but also understand, hey, there's something I can do besides my doll here. And something I can do that besides just masking the symptoms, maybe I can support my body in a different way. And krill oil has the research to show that. And I think people starting then make that connection of, oh, food can change how my body feels acutely and how I'm, my emotions are acutely, as well as this, oh, I just eat because I want to live forever or whatever. You know, it's just, uh, it's important to just continue to highlight those different factors. Absolutely, man. And that's the beautiful thing too. I'm so glad you brought this up because something, this is what's so powerful about food is that something that's good for one thing is probably good for a whole lot of other things. So we were talking about this in the context of cognitive function. And then we look at the cognitive, um, the, the context of how this supports the female re reproductive system. And also, if you look up, think about the color, think about the color of the krill oil and the astaxanthin. And you think about how nature provides, it's not even clues, it's providing specific instructions on what foods are good for. And there's this whole body of science called the doctrine of signatures. I know we've talked about this before, but it's basically that food will tell you what it's good for based on the way it looks, smells, tastes, or how it functions in nature. And sure enough, like we keep, ha we, we're just affirming things with our modern science that our ancestors have told us already. And there's another thing that we dive into, and I think it's one of the most remarkable things in the book is a science of flavor. And this, this, this powerful phenomenon called post-ingestive feedback. When you eat a specific food, your body is taking notes on what it got from that food. Selenium, copper, aminos, DHA, whatever. It's like taking notes. Okay, this taste is associated with these things. And it's, it's, it's how we evolve. And so your body knows. And this is where this idea of cravings come from. But food manufacturers have hijacked the system. And so it's functioning abnormally now. And we also talk about how do we fix that too. Um, but the, I want folks to understand that flavors are indicators of nutrition to our body, all right? And now today, we can, food, previously, when they take this, it's a gas chromatograph. It's basically how you can like isolate the chemicals and flavors and then add it to other things. Nowhere in history did a thing taste like another thing. Now we can make like mm. uh, uh, some noodles taste like tacos or whatever. Like you can, and it's not necessarily exactly, but it's just enough to muddy up the waters 
where your brain and this post ingestive feedback to like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. Like, yeah, there's your body's fake, just beef, fake fish sticks, fake, fake chicken, fake ham, fake, you know, like all of these other things. It's like, I can't believe it's not ham. <laughs> you know, it's like, a, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's a real thing that's out there. So yeah, you're man. absolutely right. You've got yeah. the tofurkey. And the thing is for your body, you're not getting the same nutrients that historically would have come along with these flavors. And so this is part of the reason and this, you're not hearing about this in these diet conversations about why folks are struggling. And it's because of the wiring, it's the hard wiring and how do we fix these things? One of those things that was found to uh, reverse and kind of reduce the urge to eat hyperpalatable foods was chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is really remarkable in helping your, your palate. And when we talk even about flavor and taste in the palate, this is largely based on certain proteins are creating this flavor experience. So this is a very real thing. When we're saying my taste buds change or my flavors change, my, my ability to, my, my palate changed, there's a change that happens with food and what you're eating will change the proteins that your body's producing and associating with what's happening in your saliva when you're interacting with food. So, and that's the thing about food again, rather than supplementation being our go-to for improving our health, we need to have food first and allow supplements to be a good supplement for that because it, ch- it literally changes your overall biology. And if I could, I'm going to share one more for the brain because I think it's really important and it's not talked about very often is the power and the difference, by the way, we go through in the book and we talk about all the different types of fat, body fat, because that is a massive conversation. We've got storage fats, which is the white adipose tissue, visceral fat, subcutaneous fat, intramuscular fat, but your brain, and you know this too, Aubrey, I know that we've said this before. But, you know, our brain is mostly made of fat, so we need to eat more fats. And it just seems logical. But that's like the same. It's very close to believing that if we eat fat, it'll make you fat. And understanding the brain is actually very different in its fat construct than your body fat. Your brain has no storage fats. It's not the same thing as your body fat. Your brain is made of structural fats. And this is an evolutionary adaptation because in times of famine, if your brain was made of storage fats, your brain theoretically would eat itself as a fuel source. And it's basically built in homemade zombie food. It's just not how, thankfully, we're wired up. Your brain is made of structural fats. And guess what? The omega-3 fatty acids, huge player in this. And also, here's the other camp I want everybody to know about, phospholipids. All right, phospholipids. And phospholipids are largely made from omega fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA. So just saying again how important those are, but you can also get phospholipids directly from food sources like fish, crab meat, uh, plant sources like oats. Uh, Krill is another great source of phospholipids and why they're so remarkable. Uh, Milk, sunflower seeds. But how does this play out in the data? Oh, by the way, eggs continue to be a big, like DHA, phospholipids, the list goes on and on in their benefits. But listen to this. And get those orange yolk eggs. Get those ones that are that are farmed in a way that they're actually eating what a chicken should eat, not those sickly yellow, pale, hotel, you know, buffet eggs. Like that, those ain't gonna have the things you're looking for. Exactly. And now again, we have really sound science on the difference. And we go through that as well. But listen to this data published in the journal Hormones and Behavior found that specifically your thyroid influences the brain's processing speed, efficiency, and executive functions, and overall learning behavior. So your thyroid is a major player in your cognition. And phospholipids are essential in that brain-thyroid connection, all right? So just right off the bat. And also that signal transduction and your brain cells being able to communicate with each other, phospholipids play a major role in that. And lastly, this was a study, and this was highlighted in the journal Lipids and Health and Disease, looked at the influence of phospholipids on short-term memory function. So this is like name, face, acquisition, remembering phone numbers, shit like that, that we don't do anymore, that we've outsourced. Uh, but they found the test subjects, and this was in test subjects with, with cognitive decline, to find out what an intake of phospholipids could do. And after just three weeks of increased phospho, uh, phospholipid intake, they observed a substantial improvement in their short-term memory. And these were folks who, again, had noted cognitive decline. 
This directly improved their memory, taking in phospholipids. All right, so there's so much more, obviously, but we need to give our brain, there's a specific neuronutrition. Your brain has a different diet in many ways in the body, but your brain will also, there's this blood-brain barrier has express lanes for sugar, all right? The sugar gates are wide open and your body will gladly confiscate half of the sugar that you consume, all right? Your brain is only 2% of your, it's of your body's mass, but it's consuming upwards of 25 to 30% of the calories you take in, specifically sugar, all right? So when somebody's doing the do, this isn't a joke. Like that's directly going to your brain and fucking stuff up. Like in that, you know, the do commercial, like somebody's like, ah, do the do. You know, they're jumping off the skateboard ramp. That's what's happening in your brain. Somebody's like wiping out in your brain, you know? Every time, because your, your brain is just like, how evolved sugar got that preferential treatment getting into that VIP section of your body. Now the abnormal amount of sugar we're taking in directly leads to cognitive decline in today. And I went through the data uh, in the book. Now we're, call, we're referring to Alzheimer's as type three diabetes because of the insulin resistance that starts to take place in your brain. I think one of the things that I've, you know, the science goes really deep on food and on the different macronutrients and micronutrients. And I think it's sometimes possible to get lost in a lot of these ideas and constructs and not really listen to yourself. And I think the place that I've arrived is really working on a deeper trust of self, you know, and a deeper trust of what's going on. Even, you know, like I mentioned, Dr. Paul Saladino makes an excellent case to steer away from pretty much most plants from a materialist reductionist standpoint. However, for me, like when I'm eating these different things, the way that I feel, I can, I just know that, all right, yeah, you may be right in what you're saying. I'm not going to argue with you about, you know, these different anti-nutrients that might be there to protect the plant from other, you know, scavengers and other organisms. Like I get it. However, there's a certain life force quality. There's a certain thing that I, I don't even, I don't understand. Maybe it is, it does have a, a way to reduce it into some molecules, but I started to really appreciate that my body actually has a wisdom if it gets beyond its own addictions and its own cravings, because as you said, the brain could reach for the dew and you know you could be tricked into eating the Doritos that with the nacho cheese flavor when really we want some probiotic rich, raw ch cultured cheese and that's what your body wants, but it doesn't know the difference. There's ways we can be tricked, but if you really start to know yourself, trust yourself, and you'll guide yourself to food. We, we get that with a pregnant woman, you know, who's like, ah, and in some ways we do, it's like, oh, I was craving pickles. You know, and sometimes we're like, ha ha, craving pickles. But there was something there. There was something in the vinegar. There was something in the salt. There was some aspect. But we kind of get that. But we don't realize that we're doing that all the time. We have that capability. And I think that's one of the things I love about your book, too, is it's not dogmatic. It's just putting out ideas, general structures, but then ultimately saying there isn't just one way. And, and where that leads me is where I'm really at right now is, I get it. I get the general concepts. I understand it, which is good. But let me be guided toward what feels good for me. You know, and you know, if that granola with the with the real oats, you know, is what feels good to me, or having like the overnight oats and chia, even though I understand that you know all the things with carbohydrates, that just sometimes feels good for me. And my body feels nourished. And I have a smile that comes a little quicker and and laughs that come a little and it so that's evidence too, you know, and, and that's, I think, something that I know you believe in as well. And, and I want to just leave people with as we're wrapping up here is just trust your N of one, you know, evidence of really what feels good for yourself. Yeah, thank you so much. That's, that's powerful. And that was the mission, you know, because, you know, the system, the, the, you know, the publishing system, all that structure is very bent on like, let's, how do we make this into you know, like go in line with this hot thing, right? This new diet framework or like eat this, not that. And I'm again, I'm, I'm very, I'm just sick of it. We have to direct ourselves back to ourselves. We have to direct folks inward and really start to tap into our body's own inner intelligence, our inner guidance system towards the things that we need because no one knows better than you. And if I can help provide some things to help clear up that static on the line, Oh man. Wow. Just look at where we can go. You know, and so that was really the mission to be a unifier, 
of the best diet frameworks? What are the best things about it? And also, what are some of the things that could take us out? Let's do a little bit to avoid some of those things so we can create more clarity, more connection. But most importantly, we can turn within and start to see what's going on in our own minds, in our relationship with food, in our relationships with each other. Because food, man, food is everything. It really is. It makes up everything about us. And it's so powerful. But at the same time, knowing that, that one thing, that food can be a powerful tool of healing and connectivity, but it can also be used as a weapon of degradation and disease. And we get to choose. And that's what's so cool right now and so powerful. And with so much changing in the world right now, they're easier. It's, it's easier for us to create something better, but we have to take out the opportunity. We've got to step up and make it happen. And a big part of that, I believe, is nourishing ourselves, getting ourselves healthier, our families and our communities at large. Let's go. Hoka. Hoka. It's a rallying cry for sure. Your book available everywhere, even in targets, as you mentioned, all around, all around the country, Amazon, all the things. And when this podcast releases, it will be out everywhere. So uh, eat smarter. Let's do it. Let's fucking do it. Not only for us, but for everybody. That's right, brother. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate you. Love you. I love you too, man. Appreciate you as well. Thanks for checking out this video. For more like it, please subscribe to my channel. And of course, the Aubrey Marcus podcast with new episodes every single week. And follow me on Instagram at Aubrey Marcus. Thank you so much.